Warning, this video will contain spoilers for the game Aliens Colonial Marines. On December 11, 2006, Sega announced that they had acquired the license to influential film franchise Alien. Included in this announcement was a mention of a first-person shooter and role-playing game that would release no earlier than 2009. On December 15th, just a few short days later, it was revealed that Gearbox would be the studio behind the first-person shooter. The press release notes that Gearbox was signed on to create the game and that Sega taps Gearbox to create it, rather than publishing a game already in development. In November of 2008, following the release of Brothers in Arms Hell's Highway, a Gearbox-developed franchise, word spread that Aliens Colonial Marines had been halted and 15 to 25 employees had been laid off. Randy Pitchford, president of Gearbox, stated that the project was not cancelled and to say it was halted was an inaccurate characterization. In 2012, Randy Pitchford and Gearbox began to demo Aliens Colonial Marines. Responses were largely positive and fans were eager to play. I myself got to watch and play some of the game at PAX East 2012. The game looked beautiful and what you'd expect of a AAA developer, especially for a game that's been in development since roughly 2006. The game released in February of 2013, but something was wrong. The graphics weren't as impressive, certainly, but every scene from the game demos was either different or not in there at all. The AI, animations, levels, none of it seemed nearly as polished as any of the demonstrations suggested. Most surprising of all was the sudden appearance of roughly four or five studio names in the opening credits. The reviews came in, and across multiple platforms, Aliens Colonial Marines was ranked low. Really low lower than Duke Nukem Forever on each platform. When asked why the final product was so different to the demonstrations, Randy Pitchford responded that they'd be looking into that and had stakeholders to think of. In the time since release, a variety of posts and blogs from alleged employees of Sega, TimeGate, and even Gearbox have made claim about where the development money went and who was responsible for the poorly received game. It has become quite the fiasco and turned Aliens Colonial Marines from a mere disappointment to an insult towards gamers and fans of the franchise. But is Aliens Colonial Marines really that horrible of a game? Is it truly so broken, so painful, so user unfriendly as to be worse than Duke Nukem Forever? In an effort to critique the game fairly, I'm going to try and analyze Aliens Colonial Marines on its own merits, divorce it from its development history and any knowledge of the inner workings of Gearbox or Sega, and tackle it on its own terms. By the end, I hope to see what kind of game Aliens Colonial Marines is and what really went on in its design versus its development. So let's get started. What sort of game is Aliens Colonial Marines? <laughs> Colonial Marines plays like the developer wanted to make an Aliens game for the Call of Duty crowd. While Call of Duty wasn't the first game to implement first-person cinematic moments, they certainly did popularize it with Modern Warfare. Aliens Colonial Marines has a variety of these moments sprinkled throughout the game which are the first suggestion that they were taking inspiration from the popular franchise. The NPCs, or non-playable characters, also lend to this theory. For most of the game, you have invincible cohorts sprinting and gunning alongside you, their constant chatter keeping you company even when you're all alone. These characters will never die unless the story demands it. Sergeant O'Neill, your companion NPC throughout most of the game, even looks like he could have crawled out of a Black Ops or Modern Warfare title. The characters themselves play out like your typical video game marines, with a lot of this leave no man behind talk, posturing, and general attempts to sound like a badass. What really pushes this comparison full force are the presence of human enemies to fight. Perhaps the developer just wanted to provide some variety in the experience, or perhaps someone didn't have enough faith that the Xenomorphs could provide enough entertainment to carry an entire game. No matter the reason, the player ends up dedicating a significant chunk of time to fighting other humans. Their behavior is just what you would predict. One for cover, duck behind it, occasionally pop out to shoot the player. Unfortunately, the AI and levels never achieve this sort of polish as a Call of Duty game. They don't even achieve home front quality. Every encounter is just an exercise in shooting someone in the face as they pop up from behind a wooden crate. I could be completely off base, but all of these elements combined together suggest a game that was meant to appeal to a certain type of crowd. It could be that's just the current trend and I'm not necessarily against combining the Aliens license with a variety of game styles, including the Call of Duty type. I do believe there are better ways to go about it than trying to force the franchise to merely be a reskinning of a pre-existing game, though.
Aliens Colonial Marines is buggy, it is bland, and it is a worthless game on a consumer level. It is not, however, a bad game. Not ever actually defining bad as a game that is mentally or emotionally painful to play, a game that does not work due to the amount of malfunctional bugs preventing it from performing as intended, or design elements actively interfering with any sort of fun that could be had from the game. Aliens Colonial Marines functions, and it provides the appropriate level of feedback to encourage continued play. The problem is that these are the bare minimum requirements and only achieves its goal of being a game by being interactive. Aliens Colonial Marines merely exists. It is, by definition, bland. Which is a shame because there are good moments scattered about. Being surrounded by xenomorphs can be a hectic and exciting experience, but there are all these small touches that ruin it. Aliens only approach you on the ground. They never strike at you from the ceiling, wall, air vents, or other parts of the surroundings. They will always be on the ground, running awkwardly at you and swinging away. It also seems as if it takes a bit too much to kill these things. Not that it takes a lot, they go down pretty easily, but when compared to James Cameron's Aliens film, the one that inspired the game, it seems to take quite a few more bullets. In the film, they practically shattered from the weapon's fire. The danger of these creatures is supposed to be their numbers and the ability to bounce around the terrain. Unless you're unarmed, these creatures are at their best when you can't see them coming. Or when their numbers are too great. Man, there's a shooting gallery down there. Ten. Five. That's it. Jesus. They're wall to wall in there. Thirteen. That's meters. right outside the door. Hicks, Vasquez, get back! Man, this is a big signal. Unfortunately, this leads to two of the greater flaws of Aliens Colonial Marines. If these creatures were to shatter like in the films, then they'd be too easy. But the Xenos never really make use of surprise tactics like in the films, and with the exception of a couple key moments, you only encounter a handful of the beasts at a time. There's never that moment when the clip empties and the player shouts, oh sh as they frantically wait for the reload animation to cycle. It should seem as if these things will never stop coming. The only time the game applies this is after the player gets the smart gun for the first time. Why this weapon had barely any presence in the game, I don't know. But the first time you get it, you expect to feel like a badass. Unfortunately, you just stand at the end of a hallway, spray out a wave of Xenos, and then walk forward until you trigger the next spawn event. This is the closest you get to desperately wondering when they'll stop coming, but not because the situation is challenging or desperate. It's because you want to use the smart gun for something more awesome than simply shooting fish in a barrel or aliens in a corridor, as it were. In the end, you were given a smart gun just to make this tiresome hallway easier, which neither succeeds in tension nor in a temporary boost of excitement or confidence. This is not when the player should have been given the smart gun. It should have been given in a big open area where aliens literally could have come from anywhere. But since the item is worthless once it runs out of ammo, of which it has little, there's very little reason to pick it up later on. Ammo for your regular weapons are plentiful, and the smart gun just doesn't give enough of a boost to warrant using. In all other instances of the game, these encounters are always finite. You get about a half dozen Xenos to worry about, and then it is time to move on. This is unfortunate as there are instances where the game gives you the impression a never-ending ward is coming your way and could inspire the player to flee, but that move will only result in the player's death. This is another great missed opportunity as the need to flee could provide a lot of high-speed adrenaline pumping gameplay. 
forcing the player to approach the game and its level design differently. There is one particular xenomorph that you do have to run away from, though. There are two encounters where the player must escape from the potential clutches of what I'll refer to as the Praetorian in keeping consistency with the Aliens vs. Predator games. In the first encounter with the Praetorian, you're supposed to get through a door and seal it shut behind you. The first door is an incredibly tense moment, but then you're forced to keep sealing doors to the point that there are just too many between you and the creature. The need to keep moving is hampered by the repetitive nature and knowledge that you have enough time, including a variety of other obstacles such as sections the player needs to crouch under or run through would have made it better, and perhaps a second door that the player gets halfway through before the Praetorian begins denting and pounding to bits. This would change up expectations and force the player to hurry on even faster in a desperate desire to survive. Instead, you're just asked to repeat the same trick several times, at which point the magic is gone and it becomes rote and boring. The second encounter requires the player and their NPC allies to keep ducking off the beaten path, searching for alternate routes around the Praetorian. Typically, these side passages aren't clear and just lead the player to a small encounter with a bunch of drones and warrior types, completely breaking what seemed like fast, hurried pacing and grinding it to a halt. All momentum is lost. Contrast these segments to the opening of Dead Space 2, which I touched on briefly in my previous video on silent tutorials. This is a perfect example of a game being completely scripted to look more dangerous than it really is, but because the enemies are still there and present and ready to chase after you, it never stops being intense. More so, the game directs the player by placing enemies and obstacles in the way. Any incorrect corner you may turn is immediately cut off, forcing the player to where the game wants them to go. Enemies are carefully spawned and scripted to cut off any possible dead ends, while instead directing the player on onto the correct and intended path while never removing control. The player is able to buy into the illusion and keep the tension running high. The encounters with the Praetorian never have this intensity, and in particular the second one as it requires trial and error to figure out where you should go. While the overall goal is straight ahead, the player has to make an unnecessary and immediate turn to yet another drone fight that pulls all momentum to a screeching halt. I understand the desire to pull influence from James Cameron, but the blowtorch was only really used like this in one scene and was given up halfway through. It doesn't seem like they really wanted to create a chase scene, but rather a moment to use this iconic blowtorch to make it more like the films. Perhaps it would have been better to use the blowtorch just twice as I mentioned earlier, but combine it with a chase scene from Alien 3. This chase scene focused more on pushing buttons to cut the alien off, which would have allowed the player to keep going forward while continuing to lower the doors. These doors should be fragile, however, in order to keep the player thinking quick instead of suddenly taking their time because the alien now has several bulkheads to push through. The Loader is another icon of the second film that seems to have been included for no greater reason than fan service. I've never understood the desire to put a Marine in one of these vehicles. It would be the equivalent of someone hopping onto a forklift in order to fend off hostiles. It's meant for hangar bay operations, not combat. It's slow, lumbering, and looks awkward in a fight. This doesn't change when Ripley fights the Queen with it either. It was only chosen because it was the only weapon Ripley had left. Well, looks like the developers got the awkward control and lumbering movements accurate, at least. The player's only option is to throw a few good punches into the Praetorian's head. Somehow, this Xeno can survive grenades or other explosives, but a few punches from this loader are enough to take it down. All in all, a horrible, awkward fight that lasts too long and provides an unsatisfying end to a poorly executed series of encounters. Oddly enough, the most intense and frightening moment of the entire game were the zombie aliens. Yes, all those animated images going around of these guys look awfully silly, but you're dropped into a territory with no weapons or equipment and creatures that will kamikaze you right into a perceived threat. They rely on hearing, forcing the player to find ways to quietly and slowly sneak around. Stakes are actually high. It may be easy to sneak around and not get hurt or attacked, but like Dead Space 2, the threat is real enough to keep the player alert and cautious. In fact, while I'm on the topic of types of xenomorphs, I would like to take this moment to comment on aliens that spit acid. No. It was a dumb idea in Alien Resurrection, and it is a dumb idea now. So everyone, let's just stop it. That shouldn't be how an alien weaponizes their own blood. These are not creatures meant to be attacking from a distance anyway. I mean, thus far I've made great emphasis on the sheer number of these creatures. Let's review how important terrain and stealth are as an offensive element. Large numbers, closed-in spaces, 
small holes and crevices and low ceilings that these creatures can attack from. The only reason to give these creatures acid spit is to give them a projectile weapon, in which case you need to reconsider your level design. There need to be vents, ducts, tunnels, holes, any scenery that these creatures can crawl around and blend into. The Lurker, a more hit-and-run style of foe, is perhaps the closest to how these creatures should behave. It finds places to hide while you search for it and then attacks you at random. The problem is that the AI seems to be, well, too random, and sometimes doesn't seem to register when you have found it. And unless there are plenty of dark shadows in the area, the alien doesn't have a lot of good hiding places. The entire room should be designed for an encounter with the lurkers, where there are pipes or other objects protruding in such a way that the alien can sneak right along it or within that they manage to blend. Finally, we come to the Alien Queen herself. I like how they try to tackle this confrontation. Most of these Alien games have you directly fight the Queen with a ton of heavy-duty equipment, but this time you had to go about it like a puzzle. It was a lot more like the original Alien or Alien 3, where Ripley had to use the tools of the environment to indirectly defeat her foe. Unfortunately, as always, there are some issues. The first is the logic of it all. The goal was to push the Queen out of the hangar bay, but requires five different buttons to be pushed. There is no practical reason to require someone to press so many buttons for what I'm guessing is a manual launch for a jet, dropship, or other form of flight vehicle. I understand having a separate red button with a plastic cover over it and a warning label saying, Are you sure? Just to allow someone the ability to do such a manual launch. But I cannot understand several. Could be I just don't know how these things work, but to me it seems more likely this was done in order to draw out the conflict. Being forced to hide from the Alien Queen is a great callback to Newt in the climax of Aliens, but like all great ideas in this game, it is executed in a half-hearted, tedious manner. The Queen seems to rely on line of sight and is too quick to respond. While this is certainly annoying, it's also not very challenging as the Alien Queen does little damage and the game has respawning armor all over the place. Instead of being annoying because it's too hard, it's merely annoying because it's such a hassle. Would have been better if there were a variety of ways to distract the Queen with the environment. Using a remote control to activate a turret across the room and draw the queen away. Turning on some warning sirens in the hangar bay. Or just merely throwing a grenade across the room to make a noise. If you want the player to think outside the box, then provide plenty of options for them to do so. Instead, the player has to draw the queen to one end of the hangar bay and hope she stays over there long enough to run to the other side, jump out into the open, and flick a damn switch. At first, I thought the tension to the scene was supposed to be the time limit. The other characters tell you ahead of the battle that you have 8 minutes, but this battle can certainly run longer than that with no detriment. The time limit doesn't really exist, which only makes me wonder why it was mentioned anyway. While many of these encounters, such as with the Praetorian and the Queen, are appreciated for trying to switch things up and give the player something to do other than shoot things, it simply wasn't enough. Iconic items like the blowtorch and power loader were implemented, but why didn't the player get a chance to use the APC? It has guns on it, and the idea of having to outrun a group of crushers is exciting. In a genre plagued with unnecessary vehicle sections, piloting a dropship to escape an exploding facility in time, or driving an APC to flee the xenomorph hordes could have been a great way to break the monotony into smaller chunks. Instead, the player either gets to shoot xenomorphs, humans, or xenomorphs and humans at the same time. None of it very exciting and only achieving the bare minimum of requirements to be a playable experience. This is where the fusion of Call of Duty and Aliens falls apart. While I'm fine with making a game of any style based on the Aliens property, it has to be done true to the spirit of its source material. So what is the spirit of this influential franchise? Aliens are f***ing frightening, yo. Or to embellish a bit more, the aliens are a force so far beyond what we could have imagined that nothing has prepared us for them. Just one of them is capable of starting a chain reaction that could result in the permanent extinction of humanity. Now, I know there are a lot of other, deeper themes portrayed through the character of Ripley, and each individual film has its own themes unique to that particular story. But those themes aren't always going to carry over. Ripley's story has ended with Alien 3, or rather, it should have. And just because James Cameron explored things like the maternal instinct in his film, doesn't mean David Fincher needed to explore it in Alien 3. In fact, what makes each film so strong is that they're exploring a different aspect of Ripley, building her into someone much more defined in the end. We know more about her by the end of Alien 3 than we simply did at the end of Alien. So if we're going to be continuing this franchise without Ripley, we have to get down to the basics. And the basics are that aliens are f***ing frightening. Naturally, this is one of those important elements Aliens Colonial Marines fails at. In fact, the characters are all pretty well adjusted to a foobar situation. You start the game going after a squad that just faced these creatures the first time. Well, we're not dead. So, you know, there's that. 
Actual, I got solid copy. We lost keys. Pretty sure something exploded from this chest. Is Winter with you? Yes, sir. Any thoughts on the exploding chest issue? That's pretty calm and collected. What about the Marines in the film Aliens, the inspirational source for this game? Get away from me, man! Dead! Wake up from there, one minute I'm gonna kill you! Back off, Dad! Yeah. Then we go back in there and get f***ed, Dad! Don't leave our people behind us, I ain't going back in there, You can't help lady. them! This ain't happening, man. This can't be happening, man. This ain't happening. Alright, maybe this is just a more badass squad of Marines or something. How about when the character Bella discovers she has an alien inside of her? Why are you looking at me like that? Uh, tell her. Tell me what? What the hell is going on? When you woke with the xenomorph on your face. I told you, it was dead. There's nothing wrong with me. Did its exterior resemble bones, white in color, almost like a spider with a tail? Yeah, my throat hurt a little, but I'm fine. Bella, you're gonna die. How do we know that? It happened to Keys. How long? Hours, maybe a day. I'm gonna throw up. Wow, just... Okay, you're gonna throw up. Is that your plan on getting it out? And I can tell your friends really care because, well, listen to the strain as their superior gives them instructions. Well, Ripley was pretty hardcore, right? How'd she react when she discovered there was an alien inside of her? Freeze it. Hold on. Let's hear that again. Freeze it. You don't want to look at it. Freeze it. Sorry. Here we have the character commonly referred to as 85 being forced to break the bad news. You can see the disbelief on his face as he looks at the screen, hear the dread from his voice, and feel his sympathy as he tries to spare Ripley the sight of her own inevitable demise. It's not just Ripley's pain we're being exposed to. This moment means so much more to Ripley's character than 85's, after all. But 85 still has a reaction. He has a reaction. I'm gonna throw up. He has a reaction! I mean, for crap's sake, this O'Neill guy is supposed to be f***ing Bella. The most he could do is put his hand on her shoulder. Then later on down the line, we're supposed to bind this melodramatic pain he's going through? Who f wrote this sh Aliens are f***ing frightening. This is the common theme, and the best way the films are able to represent this common theme was through the characters. Alien subverts the hoorah macho marine attitude by showing the conceit through a character like Hudson. One minute he's talking like top dog. Check it out. I am the ultimate badass. Yes, State of the badass art. You do not want to f with me. Check it out. Hey, Ripley, don't worry. Me and my squad of ultimate badasses will protect you. <laughs> Check it out. Independently targeting particle beam failings. What? For I have a city with this puppy. We got tactical smart missiles, phase plasma pulse rifles, RPGs. We got sonic electronic ball breakers. We got nukes. We got knives, sharp sticks. Knock it off, Hudson. Then all hell breaks loose. Seven 
17 days. Hey, man, I don't want to rain on your parade, but we're not going to last 17 hours. Those things are going to come in here just like they did before, and they're going to come in here, and they're going to come in here, and they're going to get Hudson! us. Aliens Colonial Marines could have pulled off a similar subversion as Spec Ops The Line, and it would have been in spirit with the Aliens film. Every moment possible, James Cameron shows off these Marines as being incompetent while having an incompetent leader. If you are going to make an Aliens game that played like Call of Duty, then the best thing would have been to change up how the Marines typically act. Sometimes it feels like your AI partners in Call of Duty will beat the game for you. Go the opposite route in Colonial Marines. Have characters that panic in the corner, have soldiers shoot blindly into the shadows, have Marines gung-ho killing whatever they can. The point is, these are human beings, not robots. Just because they were trained to be killing machines doesn't mean they are free of fear. They were trained to kill other humans, and when you put them up against something they're not prepared for... Talk to me. Copy, copy. Huh? Talk to me. Hey, Get them out of there. Shut up. Do it now. Shut up. God, where's the phone? Where's the phone? The players should not feel prepared for their first encounter with these aliens, and it should only be survived by fleeing to a more safe location. The loss of lives should be visible, and the stress should hit everyone hard. This is another key lesson. Stress can be a cause of dramatic tension. In Aliens, the drama is different for each character. Hudson causes drama because he's losing his cool. Vasquez is looking for something to direct her anger toward. Burke wants to do what's most profitable for Wayland Utani. Most importantly, not every character is creating drama. Hicks has a cool head and yields leadership to Ripley. Gorman may have created drama earlier, but later on he also yields leadership. Drama should feel natural. You should be able to place yourself in that character's shoes. But there should also be characters that don't fall apart or have them fight against the downward spiral. These are the characters we should look up to, the ones that try and stay sane. None of the characters in Aliens Colonial Marines feel like they're really suffering mentally. They are obeying orders and keeping calm and collected until the next cutscene where the writer demands they behave a certain way. The conflicts are few and far between and largely phoned in, focusing on this whole leave no man behind shtick. Nothing comes from the drama though, no one dies as a result, the team doesn't separate, no consequences are suffered, it's just there for the sake of drama. Good to see you all in one piece, O'Neill. Good to see you? You wanted to leave him out here to die. Bo, what are you talking about? We disagreed. She tried to pull rank and leave you for dead. Look, everyone calm down. I was scared. I'm just a pilot, but as lieutenant I have to make a call. We don't leave Marines behind. That supersedes rank. Hey! Can we not do this out here? Bella, we cannot risk the lives of multiple Marines to save one. We understand what you're going through, but it's hard to trust someone who won't be alive in a few hours. What did you just say to me? You know, I was gonna save this last bullet for myself. Whoa! It's fine! It's fine! We're fine! Just put it down, Bella! Bella, put it down. You just pointed a gun at a superior officer. Last I checked, your orders were to put one in your skull should the time. Stop come. it! Just let's get back to operations, all right? Damn it, you two! What is most amazing is how much more personality the characters and aliens have, even though most of them get hardly any lines at all. From the moment they wake up, they're behaving like real people. Have you ever been mistaken for a man? No. Have you? <laughs> hey, I sure wouldn't mind getting some more of that Arturian boom thing. Remember that time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the one that you had was male. <laughs> it doesn't matter when it's Arturian, baby. And I'm telling you, I got a bad feeling about this drop. You always say that, Frost. You always say I got a bad feeling about this drop. Okay, okay. When we get back without you, I'll call your folks. Drake, check your camera. There seems to be a malfunction. That's better. Look, we can't have any firing in there. I, uh, I want you to collect magazines from everybody. Crazy! What the hell are we supposed to use, man? Harsh language? 
Even in the linear first-person shooter, there are ways to sprinkle dialogue like this around. It's not impossible to have interesting, sincere characters populating the world of your game. It's just a matter of how you write them and how you make them behave. This is how you get the player to care about your characters. Also keep in mind that Hicks, Hudson, and Vasquez are the most developed characters throughout the entire opening of the film. The other Marines are typically interacting with one of these three. There is rarely, if ever, a moment where two Marines speak without any input from Hicks, Hudson, or Vasquez. The film makes sure you recognize their names since you'll be spending the rest of the movie with them. Of course, to truly get a player used to these characters, the story needs to take a bit more time. Games are always rushing to get to the action, which does little to provide context or develop an emotional attachment. The player doesn't care when the ship, Sephora, explodes because they were rushed onto the Sulaco as soon as possible. The game is in too much of a hurry to get the player shooting aliens. How could a player care about the Sephora, the world, or the characters if the game clearly doesn't either? Everyone loves to discuss the tram car ride at the beginning of Half-Life and all the scientists you get to meet, but they seem to misunderstand the purpose it serves. The player gets familiar with Black Mesa and its employees before disaster strikes. It establishes a status quo that gets disrupted. You get to go back and then see how Black Mesa has changed from this disaster. This is what your typical first act of a story is supposed to do. Aliens Colonial Marines could have easily had the player wake up from cryostasis and provide a series of exercises as an optional tutorial. It would make sense for Marines to have to get their bodies used to movement again after being stuck so long in a cryotube. Allow the player to explore the ship, overhearing conversation from other characters. I mean, Criminy, even Doom 3, from a franchise known for nothing but running and gunning, established a story and environment better than Aliens Colonial Marines does. Welcome to Mars City. This facility serves as the central hub for all scientific research, Attention. archaeological Director study, Banks. and military Please report operations. To central administ- Listen, Scotty, I've done this a million times. It's not that hard. Why don't you crawl your fat ass down here and do it yourself? Because I'm getting paid to make sure you do it. Jeez! Do you make a habit of sneaking up on people? Everyone's already on edge down here with all the strange things that have been going on. In fact, let's take a closer look at O'Neill and Bella, the two characters that are at your side for most of the game. They're supposed to have some sort of sexual relationship, but if O'Neill hadn't bluntly said so, you'd have never guessed. O'Neill, what's wrong? Sounded like Bella. We had a thing, okay? What kind of thing? The two never show that much attraction for each other, and even with all his rage later on, the two could merely just have a strong friendship. Let's jump back to when Bella finds out she has an alien inside of her and is going to die. I'm gonna throw up. Really? That's his reaction? A hand on her shoulder? Freeze it. You don't wanna look at it. Freeze it. Okay, okay, you get the idea with that clip. But he barely reacts when he finds out a woman he cares for is about to die, and then we're supposed to buy this. And, uh, she had one of those face huggers. It left a baby one in her chest. How, how do you get it out? You, 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 you can't. Wrong answer. Please, 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 please. Hey, Mel. Hey, Nugget. That's okay. Just close your eyes. You get that, Maureen? You promised. Get everyone off the planet. Who rod ashes about? Wait! Do you even know? Do you even know what you take away? Now let's consider Vasquez and Drake. The film never mentions a relationship between these characters, but they show an awful lot of scenes and interactions that suggest there might be something going on. Oh, Vasquez. He just too bad. Vasquez threatens to harm Lieutenant Gorman, you can understand where that rage is coming from. You know there was something special between these two. Maybe they were just good friends, maybe there was romance. Either way, you can see the affection without the film bluntly explaining it. What kind of thing? O'Neill and Bella are the only real relationship in Aliens Colonial Marines, be it platonic or romantic, and yet it feels so disconnected, clunky, and fake. We should have been sad when Bella met her inevitable end, at the very least for O'Neill. Instead, we don't 
care. She dies. Oh well. The captain is dying on the dropship. Who cares? These were archetypes of archetypes. They were never human. The only time they came across as such was when O'Neill mentioned he had a carnal relationship with Bella. The bluntness spoke to his character, sure, but every other interaction just didn't measure up. We needed to see some real drama, some real tension and reactions from the Marines. We needed to see some of them high-strung, trying to keep themselves together while others allow themselves to lose their temper because they didn't know what else to do. Groups dividing to go do their own thing. Characters being chipped off one at a time. Most importantly, the protagonists needed to be left alone in the end. They needed to survive by the skin of their teeth, with nothing more than luck as the reason they survived. This is perhaps the greatest problem with James Cameron's take on the Aliens franchise, as it allows this action-packed conclusion that gives everyone the urge to fist bump with a hell yeah! You aren't left with the same sort of tension as when Ripley was left all alone after hearing her co-worker Lambert killed over the radio. Even the promotional poster for Alien said this time it's war. The alien wasn't a war, it was a slaughter. While James Cameron technically kept this intact, the superficial elements were more aliens, guns, explosions, boom, bam, death, sweet, yeah! That is why so many of these games are focused on shooting hordes of aliens without the necessary element of horror to come with it. This is why Aliens Colonial Marines falls flat. All they saw were a bunch of marines shooting aliens and took the superficial elements from there without understanding any of the underlying themes or ideas that elevated it beyond a typical Schwarzenegger shtick. The final conflict adds insult to injury. You'll remember that I liked the concept of this final fight, but no design choice could have saved it from the Queen's actual defeat. The glory of killing Her Royal Majesty is stolen from the player and handed off to a barely present NPC with little significance. It's supposed to be some sort of honorable death for this guy, but we didn't know him. All we know is he lied about our mission goal once and it pissed O'Neill off. Should I hate this guy? Should this be his redemption? Remember how Gorman was a complete screw-up of a lieutenant that could only redeem himself by granting Vasquez and himself a more merciful death? Most importantly, remember how he wasn't the one who killed the alien queen? Ripley was? You know, our heroine? Aliens Colonial Marines fails as a story on every level. It doesn't understand what purpose the Marines served in James Cameron's film, what ideas they are meant to convey. The aliens aren't threatening, none of the characters are interesting, none of them act like real people. Whether they live or die is meaningless in the grand scheme of things. In fact, everything that happens in the story sounds like it came from a script writing for Dummies Guideline. Hell, even the film that must not be named had a better story and characters. Yet there are no words for the disgust I have for including Hicks in the story. You know, Hicks, the guy that dies in the beginning of Alien 3. You know, that death that everyone's so hung up on. Perhaps this is Gearbox's big middle finger to Alien 3 because they're so hung up on it too. Or perhaps it was just something the Gearbox writers thought would be a good idea. I don't know, but it wasn't. Dumb idea to bring him back. More dumb than aliens that spit acid. Alright, fine. You went the cheap fan fiction-y route and brought Hicks back. So... What the hell? How'd he survive anyway? The ship was on alert because Michael Whalen's PMCs illegally boarded the ship. The four cryopods ejected safely, but I obviously wasn't in mine. So, whose body was in your cryotube? That's a longer story. I care about one thing, taking these guys down. W what? Uh, I'm sorry. S sorry. <laughs> Look, sorry. Could you, could you repeat that? So... Whose body was in your cryotube? That's a longer story. You piece of sh You, Gearbox. You right up your god you Holy sh Really? Really? That's what. That. That. That's what explains it. Okay, yeah, that's what. That. Oh my god. That's how you're gonna just. Oh, long story. No, 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 it's cool. Long story. I get to. Jesus. Gearbox. I'm not against a game that has a colonial marine shooting aliens, or anyone shooting aliens. You know what's getting really tiresome though? James Cameron's aliens, or the constant attempts to recreate it. Never see civilians wearing the jumpsuits from the original alien. Never see people trying to explore different settings like Alien 3 did. It's like everyone is so stuck on this one movie and yet nobody can explain why it is so entertaining. That or no one actually understands it. It's like how Fight Club isn't actually about fighting, only James Cameron is even less subtle than David Fincher or Chuck P Chuck Pal... That guy that wrote Fight Club.
Why don't we ditch Wayland Utani, Ripley, and LV4264 while and try something else? Let's have a science expedition that stumbles upon a planet completely dominated by these creatures. Or how about space pirates to find some colony that was overrun? Or if you have to return to LV426, then create a real survival horror and have the character play as Newt struggling to survive in Hadley's hope. Or the next Aliens vs. Predator crossover game? Plug it on one of them planets like from the movie Predators, man. Sure, there's a lot more potential in a ruined world surrounded by deadly creatures in addition to the alien and predator themselves. Just try and make something interesting instead of trying to remake a movie that already exists. Despite all of my complaints, Aliens, Colonial Marines isn't a horrible game. Certainly isn't as bad as Duke Nukem Forever. The greatest problem, really, is its story, and if that's all it took for a game to suck, then we'd have very, very few titles worth playing. It just doesn't feel like they really worked on this game for six or seven years. It feels like a rush job to tie into a movie that just never came out. From the small touches like the rain looking like scotch tape, to the AI, to the story, Aliens Colonial Marines is just not a good game. It's not even a bad game. It's worse than that. It's worthless or worthless on a consumer level. The story of its development, on the other hand, does have meaning. I don't know how much is true and what is rumor, or what will come out by the time this video is posted to YouTube. However, I doubt this game would have gotten the low scores it had if it weren't for the demonstrations and expectation. I mean, when I was at PAX East of 2012, I bought it all hook, line, and sinker. Gearbox misrepresented their product, misrepresented who exactly was developing it, and if rumors are to be believed, misrepresented where Sega's funds were going. There is a story behind this game that certainly does serve a purpose to the industry. Unfortunately, that story came at a cost of $60 to consumers, millions to Sega, and countless hours to those that developed a game that no one likes. That sort of legacy, though a bit of a tragedy, has value to aspiring and current developers. It just doesn't have value to anyone that plays games. Hold it like that. Hold it like this. What the, the f kill someone, you f moron. Oh.